So we're going to begin now the open forum on tonight, which is uh, February 27th, uh, Thursday night, here at the, stu at the Studio City Branch Library. We're happy to have with us tonight two candidates for the judge of the Superior Court, um, one from for office number 72, Mayanna Dellinger, and also Mr. Troy, Slate, uh, Mr. Troy Slayton, who is for number 145. 145, yes. exactly. And we'll start with a brief introduction from each of you and then go to some questions. So, ladies first. All right, well, my name is Mayanna Dellinger and I'm running for seat number 72. And uh, you should vote for me if you want some new progressive change on the bench, which I think you do, because we know there's things that are not working so well with the court system as it is right now. So I present something a little uh, different. Uh, I'm not your typical uh, DA, and I'm not a, a rich individual sort of person uh, I, uh, running for office. So I'm coming from a law professor background. I'm a law professor. I specialize in uh, business law, and I also uh, do research in climate change law and policy. Uh, I think I'm the only law professor run, uh, running, uh, and that has run for a long time, so something different. Uh, I'm the only female running for that seat. We also know that the bench is uh, about 75, 80% male, so I vote for, or I'm recommending voting for me, of course, in this particular seat uh, that otherwise is being run for by two more traditional males. Uh, so by way of brief background, I graduated as number one out of 181 students from the University of Oregon School of Law, uh, earning the honorary title out of the COIF. Uh, I'm a Fulbright Scholar in Climate Change Law and Policy. Uh, several years ago, I worked for years for both state and federal uh, uh, trial and appellate court judges, so um, I have a unique insight for that seat in working behind the bench with the actual issues that judges work on. Uh, helping resolve a whole range of, of course, cases, but also motions, uh, depositions, mediations, and a lot of different things. So uh, in that seat, I'm the only one that's seen how cases are actually solved from the people that actually do it. Um, every day I teach uh, about 160 students right now. So dealing with a lot of different business issues, applying law to the facts, keeping order, not in the courtroom, but I can do that because I can in the classroom. Uh, I'm very well liked by all my colleagues uh, and all the students, especially when I give them high grades. No, I'm just kidding. Which I don't always because I'm being told that I'm sometimes tough, and I'm tough when I need to be. Uh, privately, um, as you can tell, I have a little bit of a mid-Atlantic uh, accent. I was born and raised in Denmark in a blue-collar family. First one in my family to get any kind of university degree. I worked myself through uh, university a couple times as times have changed. And um, I speak three languages fluently. Uh, let's see what else. I'm a cancer survivor and I'm a tough fighter and I'll do everything that's right. So again, in some, I bring something a little bit different to the bench, uh, first generation immigrant, female and highly accomplished. And what I think is important is, and Troy too is very good with both people and the written word. And I think it's really important that you could do both. I've written and published more than 350,000 words on, uh, on the law in uh, various legal journals around the nation. So I'm very used to writing, as judges do, and I'm very used to speaking. I do it every single day. And uh, just by way of funny little tidbits, I worked as a pro bono attorney on the Flint, Michigan water crisis and also on the Dakota Access Pipeline. So uh, I train people in, uh, by working with uh, law students every single day to do better. So again, I come from a different angle. I like to pay it forward, and I have done that, and I am focused on the issues that are important in uh, Los Angeles. I've been Great. here for 23 years. Thank you very much. Okay, and- My turn. Yes, your okay. turn. Thank you, Mayanna. My name is Troy Slayton. I am running for judge of the Superior Court in seat 145. Uh, I've lived in Los Angeles my entire life, born and raised here. I uh, went to undergraduate at UCLA, law school at Pepperdine, and for the last 15 years as an attorney, uh, well, first I started off in the DA's office and quickly realized that uh, I wasn't, uh, the DA's office wasn't appropriate for me. I saw them prosecuting cases where people really needed treatment for drug addiction, for alcohol addiction, for mental illness, as opposed to just being incarcerated. There is a place for incarceration for some, but too many people 
were not being diverted to the social services that they really needed. So uh, I saw that the DA's office wasn't for me. I clerked there for two years, even did a few misdemeanor jury trials in the DA's office, uh, tons of felony uh, matters. But uh, then I graduated and I became a defense attorney. And that's what I've done for the last 15 years. But aside from just being a defense attorney, primarily in criminal court, I also have a broad range, uh, a diversity of experience in other areas of law. I've uh, practiced in family law, in civil law, and uh, in restraining order matters, in elder abuse matters, because a judge of the Superior Court doesn't just handle criminal cases. Superior Court judges handle all types of cases, uh, from traffic court, criminal court, obviously, civil court, where people are suing each other, or suing businesses, or businesses suing each other, contract disputes, restraining orders, where people are going to the court asking for protection from uh, somebody who's harassing them or somebody who's a victim of domestic violence or elder abuse, family law cases where people are seeking divorces or a court is having to decide whether or not to rip a child from its mother's arms, child dependency, delinquency cases. So all of those types of things are what superior court judges do. Uh, the court numbering system. It's very weird. People have no idea who these judges are. Oftentimes, people just vote for a judge based on their name and the three words that are underneath their name. There is a deputy district attorney, a prosecutor running in every single judicial race. There are 12 races. Three of them are unopposed. That means a deputy district attorney is going to win automatically in those three cases. And there is a deputy district attorney in every single other race. Uh, I'm running against one a deputy district attorney, and I chose that race because that deputy district attorney happens to have a history and a record of egregious prosecutorial misconduct. So I thought that, uh, and in fact, had a case reversed for that egregious prosecutorial misconduct. And those aren't my words. Those are the words of the California Court of Appeal when they reversed that case three to zero. So I decided that that's just not appropriate, and the voters just won't know. So. And if I didn't run for that seat, that would be another unopposed seat and that person would win automatically. So I decided to run for seat 145 and I hope that the voters uh, consider me and my breadth of experience because most of the judges on the Superior Court are former prosecutors. Mm -hmm. And imagine if you were in the unfortunate situation of being in a criminal court or you have a friend or a family member or a loved one and you've got the prosecutor there with their unlimited resources. Do you also want the judge to have been a former prosecutor? And so I've been working for the last 15 years trying to get people diversion and treatment when appropriate. That doesn't mean that I want the doors to the jailhouse to be open. That means that my philosophy is that with nonviolent offenses, people should be given an opportunity to get drug and alcohol treatment. And then for violent cases, maybe incarceration is appropriate. And it's a judge, a good judge, who is in the best position to be able to know who just messed up and needs a second chance and who may benefit from some time in incarceration. So thank you for considering me, Troy Slayton, for seat 145. Great, thank you. Thank you for that, those introductions. So I wanted to ask a, a few questions. One, I think, is about which seats you might like to fill. Because I, I realize that judges for the Superior Court don't determine which court they get to serve in. That's determined by the presiding judge. Mm -hmm. So there are how many courts across L.A. County? There's more than 30 courthouses throughout L.A. County. Okay, so that's a lot. And, and you could be assigned to anyone. But so if you had a wish list, because, uh, you know, my aunt is a professor of... Uh, uh, business law. Business law and focused on climate change. Which court, I mean, is that something you want to continue to adjudicate cases that might land in a court like that? Which court would be your uh, preference? And do you have, you know, let's take it from each of you, a, a sense about where you'd like to serve. Obviously, you have no choice, but. Well, I just spoke, so yeah. Diana, go yeah. ahead. So, um, first of all, it would be a huge honor to serve. And uh, what I would like to do is I would like to serve uh, LA County and its people, again, with my diversity and my unique angle. So it'd be an honor if I got to do that. And I would certainly want to serve wherever the presiding judge would 
uh, want me to serve physic uh, physically or geographically, but also area or content wise. Uh, one day I might not mind uh, working in civil court. I've done a lot of climate change research and people think you're never going to hear a case about that. And that might be true. That's also okay. I've done that for a number of years. But you never know there's civil aspects of a lot of different things. Uh, but I certainly also wouldn't mind right now uh, doing even something like, you know, traffic court or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't, wouldn't necessarily wish to be, uh, be in any one particular area. I just would take it with a great okay. sense of humility mm -hmm. and wherever I would be needed, I could fit in. My record shows, my full CV is online, by the way, and my record shows my ability to adapt and to succeed in what I do. So I think I could do uh, not only one thing, but any of those things. I should also point out, if I may, that none of us have been judges before. Uh, and I entirely second what Troy was well, saying. Well, not true, actually. For the last four years, I've been a temporary judge for the Los Angeles Superior Court, oh. which means that I've actually been doing the job. I've been wearing the black robe, and I've been conducting the court proceedings in traffic court, in small claims, and so I've actually been doing the job for the last four years. Okay, but that's right. Um, that is good, and that's good. Thanks for serving in that role. I'm looking into doing something like that also myself. However, um, I think it is true that all of us would, uh, would undergo judicial training so yes. that we could be put in different right. positions. So I think a lot of our opponents are making much about the fact that, and as Troy correctly said, we're both running it against district attorneys and they're making much out of the fact that they're already used to doing that job every day. But I entirely second what Troy is saying that I see a great danger in a lot more uh, district attorneys uh, being elected. There's quite a few of them already. There's nothing wrong with those people personally or qualification wise. But I think there's a danger in when a system can become too biased, and I see a danger in so many prosecutors, as is the case this year, again, running for office and potentially winning, uh, claiming they have sort of the, you know, the insight and they know how to do it, that they're no better or worse than the rest of us, because we'll all need to be uh, trained as judges. And as Troy was saying, you don't want a system that's just entirely made up of the same types of people, would be my opinion. I think I and Troy re represent something a little fresher and a little more diverse. So the, the call of the question is, where would you want to serve? What would you want to do? I'd be happy to serve anywhere that I'm needed at the pleasure of the presiding judge because that's what you've got to do. And I'd be happy to do it. I'd be happy to go anywhere in the county. People vote for judges countywide, even though there's a seat number that doesn't correspond to any geographic location. So it's from Santa Clarita to Long Beach, from Santa Monica to Pomona and Lancaster and everything in between. So I'd be happy to serve. Most of my experience is in criminal law. Um, most of my jury trials have been criminal jury trials. But like I said, I have a breadth of experience in civil law and family law, restraining orders, traffic. Uh, I've sat as a temporary judge uh, in traffic court dozens and dozens of times, I think probably about 40 times, uh, where I've run the whole calendar. I've done uh, bench trials uh, in traffic and in small claims. So I'd be happy to do it uh, anywhere. Uh, obviously, I'd, I'd prefer if it's closer to where I live, but I'm happy to go anywhere. I'd be happy to get some freeway therapy. <laughs> Yes, that's correct. So no matter where you live in the county, judges run countywide. And I see another judicial candidate uh, walked in, and we should give her an yeah, opportunity her to, to join us, yeah. Carrie, Carrie Harper, who judicial is chair, uh, another right? judicial candidate. Let's have her join us so that way Thank you for mentioning we can make sure that she gets an introduction since yes. we both did that. Absolutely. We want to make sure that she gets an opportunity exactly. to do that as well. Yes, hey, how are you? Feel free to tell us. Uh, hey, nice folks. to see you. Good to see everybody again. Nice we're getting so to know each other. Yes. It's great. important to know that well, none of us campaign. are running against each other. Right. Yes, so exactly. we're all running in different uh, offices. We're all running um, against the district attorneys. Again, right. so uh, you, you have a chance to hear from all of us. And we introduced ourselves. So Harry Harper, he's hosting a show. Can yeah. you tell he's us? Tell, he's, uh, he's hosting over here. Can you here. tell us about Troy, you, Harry? Troy. Well, Troy. Tell, yeah. tell the folks at home. Uh, well. <laughs> Give us, as the other candidates, a, chance, a sense of uh, which seat you're running for and a sure. two or three minute opener about you. I appreciate it. For Thanks so much for right. the invitation. Again, I'm Carrie Annette Harper. And uh, you can visit my website at www.harper4judge.com. I am a civil rights attorney. I've been a civil rights attorney for about 17 and a half years. 
I do some, I take some criminal defense, but primarily I do excessive force cases when my clients get beat up or killed by police en route to jail. And if they survive the encounter, I defend them at the criminal court level, at the state level, and then I sue at federal district court. Uh, interestingly enough, I was a police officer uh, injured in the line of duty in the Bay Area. And um, I did that for five years. And after being injured, they put me through to paralegal school. Uh, after paralegal school, I put myself through to law school. And 9-11 happened, so I didn't get to go to the PD's office or the DA's office. And I opened my own practice, and I've been doing it ever since. I'm a congressional award winner for providing pro bono legal services, 50% in one year to indigent people. I'm endorsed by Maxine Waters. I, um, I protected the polls for Barack Obama in 2008 and uh, had votes calculated of folks who were initially turned away for illegal reasons. I had them come back in and get uh, have their ballots count. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm That's 162. 162. 162. Okay. Uh, and I would love to be considered uh, for your vote and take any questions anybody might have. Yeah, we can open it up to the floor for me if anybody has questions, or I'm happy to keep going. Any yeah, questions from the audience? Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, a lot of fellow attorneys will, uh, I do with criminal defense and also family. So it's really a good thing to see. If I don't get elected, I might see you all on the bench. So I'll be cool. But let me ask you, I mean, how, how willing would you be if you talk about um, you know, prosecuting? being on the bench and you see people do egregious acts. How willing and how much of a participant would you be to help people settle cases or to get, get better deals than the prosecution always gives? How, how much interaction would you be willing to get involved with? I, not too much that you would pressure the defendants because you know you always you do see some judges that will put their fingers on the scale so much yeah. to just really try and break defense counsel into taking a plea that their clients might not normally want to take. Uh, on the other end, you have wonderful judges that can navigate a, uh, a road to a suitable resolution and have the courtroom be ran very efficiently. And that's something that I would aspire to be. Great question. Yeah. Going to efficiency, or do you guys have well, a response? Well, I, I was just sure. going to say, I was gonna say that um, Having appeared in front of a lot of judges over the last 15 years, I've seen a lot of great judges and I've seen some awful judges. And the common thread among the great judges are the ones who were always respectful of all the participants and really let the lawyers be lawyers. They, they made sure that the lawyers follow the rules and the thing about uh, any type of court, whether it be family law or criminal law, the, the rules of procedure, the rules of evidence are the same no matter what area of law that you're in. And the good judges, and maybe you agree with this, are the ones that uh, really gave everybody a chance to be heard. They were kind and respectful, but they let the lawyers be lawyers. They let the lawyers litigate their case. And, and it, in the case of self-represented litigants, they let everybody have a chance to be heard. Mm -hmm. They called balls and strikes. They didn't appear to be on one side or the other. And it's the bad judges that really um, didn't give you that feeling. So even though a judge didn't rule in my favor, as long as I felt like I had a chance to get my argument out, then, then I was happy. And that's the kind of judge I'd want to be, one of the good judges. And I would just add to that, that um, a lot of people think that judges are always serving as criminal law judges, but as we heard already, there's a lot of other types of judges too, you know, mm -hmm. juvenile, civil, traffic, dependency. Um, so I think to answer that question, you could do you know one thing a little bit more, maybe encourage more of settlement type situations in civil cases than you can in the criminal case, criminal law cases where there's other constitutional requirements and, and so forth at issue. Um, so some of the judges I worked for, one of them in particular, uh, when he heard and I helped uh, him hear uh, civil law cases and always encouraged parties to reach a settlement instead of having the long drawn out venomous kind of trials that often end up in unhappy solutions anyway. But again, as a judge, it would depend on where you would sit, I think, and how much you could do in that situation. Right. Going to the question of efficiency of courtrooms, because as you know, uh, 
justice delayed is justice denied. You know, what can you say individually each about what you might do? Because I think running an efficient courtroom is a balance between, you know, giving everybody a fair chance and also uh, moving things along. So, you know, having had experience in court, but not necessarily as a judge, do you have ideas on your list that you'd like to deploy as soon as you get in there to move this thing along, so to speak? I don't know if I'd have a list, Troy. I mean, no. I, I do in federal, I, I, I like to pride myself on being one of the most uh, diverse in my race, but in federal district court, you have a very tight schedule, and unless you almost cough up a lung, you're not going to get too much movement, because it's a streamlined case. You're dealing with a lot, and I understand it, and there's a reason for that, so you can't show up and say, hey, can I get a continuance? It's not as easy as in criminal court where you uh, sometimes you don't have to file a formal motion to get a continuance but as a, a as a judge in a state dis in a state court you would want the parties to be either ready to go you can ask them to be on second call and discuss with the other side which is most attorneys do anyway and if they're not ready to go you know put get them out of the courtroom with a different date if they can um, figure something out while they're there, then do it. But if not, some of the courtrooms are so busy that you really have to just hurry and either do it now or you have to come back at another time because you don't want the court staff to be kept there during their lunch break or on overtime. You want to not exhaust your the folks that are working with you. But as a, you know, it depends. And I'm speaking purely from my experience in criminal right. where I don't, family law in those different areas, um, not so much. Mm -hmm. But the good thing is they send you to judge school after you're elected or appointed. So a lot of these things that we may not know the answer to now, they're going to teach us when we make the bench. <laughs> so as far as... I have a question about that. If y'all are elected, what happens to your professorship, your... Practice. Well, I had... I would be referring some of the clients out on some of the civil rights cases. Uh, I, of course, after having a discussion with the clients that I represent. And on the criminal cases, um, you try to resolve those or you refer them out. The appointment time, I'm sorry, we wouldn't be set to start until January 2021. Some of the folks would request the governor to get placed on sooner, so but for time. my practice, I'm yeah. I'd be fine with the extra time if I'm so blessed to uh, be elected. And in my case, the professorship uh, would go immediately. And you know, if you run out, <laughs> if you run, uh, no, but seriously, right? Yeah. So you could do that, and they would understand that. But immediately in this context, it's not like you don't have to start on Monday, or whatever. So there's always a transitional period. But you know, you could be. There's always other people that can step in and take over at the beginning of next semester or whatever. So that's all doable. Um, to add, or, or to, uh, if I may answer yes, the efficiency question that, uh, that we were asked before. Um, so when I was working for a superior level court, uh, I helped him achieve an above average case closing deadline. He was very proud of that. Judges are always, they want to always be seen mm -hmm. as being faster and more efficient than the rest. And I entirely helped him uh, get to that point within the one year that I was working uh, for him with 300 active criminal cases and half of the civil docket and all the pro se cases. And so he was part of that. When I was working on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is considered the, one of the most prestigious courts to work on in the nation, the second highest after the Supreme Court, I too uh, took over after a previous law clerk, it's called so a research attorney, uh, that had left a whole lot of cases undone and the judges are kind of living the clerks, for good reason, handle all the cases because we have better research skills than some of the you know, judges that haven't learned a lot of the technologies or whatever, so I'm quite used to doing all this. Him too, I helped uh, clear out all the, old, uh, rec all the old cases and get things going. So I have a record of being able to be fast and efficient, and if you take a look again, my whole resume is online. I have written uh, well over 350,000 words and published major law review articles in a short amount of time also about the, the you know obviously the law but dealing with a lot of written things fast so my record shows i could do a lot of things pretty fast okay. just to answer the question quickly I, I would i'm a partner at a law firm uh, i've been a partner there for six years i've been with the firm for 10 years and i would just wind up uh, my part of the practice and i have uh, there's 60 attorneys at my firm uh, who although my clients may not be the most thrilled because 
I'm the one working on their case, uh, they, they're, they, somebody else would have to take over those cases. Great. Uh, any questions from the crowd? Or I can continue? Okay, we had a big case that was splashed through the media recently, the Weinstein, mm -hmm. um, basically now it's a rape trial. I mean, mm -hmm. it was a rape trial. He's yes. been accused and convicted of two of the several counts of rape. Now, this is an older person, uh, but who's done a terrible crime. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about sentencing theory and like, should that person, that individual, you know, now go to something like Rikers Island or a place where, you know, it's an, a jail that, I mean, should anybody essentially be in a jail and for what reasons? And you can see how cases which are very, very serious and egregious, sometimes the punishment is, it's unclear what would be the appropriate thing to do. So. I'm, Feel free to address so, what you think about how to sentence people. There are very specific rules, uh, the canons of judicial ethics, that keep us from being able to comment on a case or controversy that may come before us. And in fact, it's, um, it, it appears that Mr. Weinstein may be uh, prosecuted by L.A. County for some other things. So we have to be very careful. Mm. Uh, canon 5 of the judicial ethics, uh, of the canons of judicial ethics, prohibit us from commenting on a, on a, a case like that. I can say in general terms, not referring yeah, to, to Mr. Mr. Weinstein, um, that um, every case is different. And as far as sentencing goes, a judge uh, is given all of the aggravating and mitigating circumstances. The aggravating circumstances are the things that point to uh, his, the, the seriousness and the the heinousness of the offense and the mitigating circumstances are the things that weigh in his favor. And that's what a judge does. Just like the scales of justice, you, you, you weigh and you balance those things and you hopefully come to a decision that is uh, fair and equitable and just and within the law. And as far, whoa, <laughs> the lights you shut out. down the house. Lost lights. <laughs> with that answer. Yes. <laughs> We're waiting. <Moonlighting. for> <laughs> so, God was listening. <laughs> wow. Well, there we go. Okay. There and is. let there be light. Yeah. That's awesome. And and so um, I think that uh, judges are in a good position to be able to read and understand and know what those things are. The the attorneys for both sides, the prosecutor and the defense attorney, file briefs giving all of that information to the judge. The probation department gives a pre-sentencing report, and all of those things are weighed. And if a person needs medical attention, the judge is able to make orders. Uh, that are appropriate for medication or, or certain types of medical treatment? So my answer to that would be, uh, in general, uh, I have done a lot of research and I believe in learning and studying what research shows. And research shows us that we don't make better people out of throwing them in jail. So I think instead of just throwing people to jail and kind of locking them up for 10 years and hoping the problem then fixes itself, we, we know that that's not what, what happens a, a lot of times, if ever. Uh, there's times when if it's a violent criminal and you know you need to make sure that they're uh, away from society for an appropriate amount of time for you know other reasons than than just their own sake uh, for society's sake that you have to do that and I could do that but I think it's also important to consider cases where it might make more sense to get the person some mental health assistance and maybe see if we could give them some training you know get them some you know on the job training or high school diplomas or something so that when they hopefully return to society they return not as you know having learned about, a lot about drug dealing or anger or whatever but having learned how to become hopefully better uh, more productive members of society again research shows us that really uh, jail serves a good purpose if you're looking at it from you know revenge point of view but really not all that much other than that and we don't of course people have to get some kind of punishment for the crimes they've done uh, but jail in and of itself i think it should be looked at like not you know, not something that is the best for at least low level crimes uh, yeah. there's other things that should be examined as well having been a police officer for a number of years some folks uh, totally and completely need to go to jail. I believe that um, there are other folks who do not need to go to jail. That was a quick answer. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that sets us up to another question. So in your views, are the laws here still in need of significant reform? Or Because, you know, for years we had laws on the books where 
misdemeanors would require jail time, you know, or, or certain kinds of low-level crimes. And then we diverted some of those crimes to where people would not go to jail, mm -hmm. and they would they would just, uh, you know, or do very short time in jail because jail's so crowded and be right. let out on the street. So, I guess my question is, you know, what do we need to do to make it so that we're not putting people in jail for low-level crimes? Mm -hmm. Well, what we need to not be doing is using the LA County jail system as a mental health treatment mm -hmm. facility. And right now, that's what it is. And uh, so much of the population in the LA County Jail are people with mental illness or what's called dual diagnosis, which is people that have both mental illness and drug addiction problems. Oftentimes people with mental illness self-treat uh, and self-medicate uh, with drugs and then they've got multiple problems. In the LA County Jail, the way that they treat mental illness is by putting somebody into a straitjacket and then handcuffing them to a chair, which causes them to degrade and it, it doesn't help things get better. It costs $65,000 a year per inmate per year uh, in the LA County Jail system and some of that money could be diverted to other types of treatment. I don't think that mental illness is a crime. I don't think that drug addiction is a crime. And I think that if somebody has engaged in a nonviolent uh, offense, then we should be doing what we can to give them uh, the opportunity for treatment and maybe use the carrot and stick approach. I've, I've heard judges say to defendants, we're gonna put the keys to the jailhouse in your hands. And if you do X, Y, and Z, if you take the opportunity to have this type of treatment and to do this sort of thing that we're offering to you, then jail will forever go up on the shelf. Um, but if you decide that you don't want to do any of these things, then maybe jail is appropriate for you. So I think uh, that, would, that sounds like a good approach for me. What do you guys think? I well think said. That, yeah, very well said. Um, I would be interested in looking into uh, the concept of restorative justice some more, and so learning some of these new, or looking into more of these newer methods. So restorative justice is the notion that, again, instead of just throwing people to jail and thinking the problem then solves itself, and at least if nothing else, we punish them, and then they'll never do the commit that crime again. Then looking instead at other methods like you know bringing the criminal face to face with the victims, you know if the victims of course are cooperative and interested in doing that too, so that the criminal, convicted criminal, can see the effects of what they've done, uh, and maybe even help you know if it was a burglary, help repair the window. So you know just simple solutions, but that actually might actually make them realize this was not a good thing I did, and that actually also could teach them some other values, uh, and for society be you know more you know, better for society instead of, again, just separating the, the victim from the uh, criminal. So restorative justice and just, you know, all in all, uh, bringing the, uh, the victims and the defend convicted defendant together and seeing, seeking out a solution it, with society's help that's newer and better than what we've looked at before. Mm -hmm. Anything to add? No. No. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, anything from the crowd? How about a question about family law? I mean, I, I have had um, limited experience in family law, but I know that it can be extremely um, contentious, and mm -hmm. contentious, and litigious, and mm -hmm. and it tears apart families, and they rip through money. So, if you get placed in a family law court, which is conceivable mm -hmm. for all, of them, mm -hmm. you know what what can you say about that? And and also is. You know, is it isn't there a better way in in Scandinavia, mm -hmm. in Sweden, there is not family law really. I mean, there must be some small, right. very tiny amount of litigation in that space. Mm -hmm. But in general, there is not an opportunity to destroy one another. What? Why are we? Why is LA County the home of family law? And is that a good thing or bad? So, uh, I, I heard a family law judge describe it to litigants that were warring in front of him just recently. He said, what you're proposing to do is take a bunch of money, put it on the table, and light it on fire. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what ends up happening. And, and no offense to the family law practitioners uh, here uh, the, in, the, in the audience, but really the only, the only people that uh, are benefiting from extended family law litigation are the attorneys. Mm -hmm. and, and so it does rip families apart. In criminal law, it's often said that we get people that 
you know, kind of messed up, but we get them on their best behavior. In family law, you get typically good people on their worst behavior. Mm -hmm. and, right. and, and people are really uh, just, it, it's at their worst and horrible things uh, happen in family law and children are placed in awful situations where they're having to decide between parents, uh, if, they're, if they're old enough to make a decision and choose between mom and dad and, it, and there are cases where there's trials about issues and a, judge, a, a child is having to be put on the stand and testify about mom and dad, and that is absolutely awful. That should be the last and worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, as a judge, I would really urge the parties to mediate and arbitrate and do everything that they can uh, short of having the judge make a decision which nobody is going to be happy with. I, I would actually welcome uh, uh, being placed in a family mm -hmm. law court. I have extremely, um, very little, limited experience with family law court, but some of the positive sides of family law is that they unite families and you have the adoption court there where they bring in um, the children that are being placed with the adoptive families and they have like parties and you know, you really get to see another side of folks That's because they're excited and happy and they're, and they're being brought together, and especially if you have a later in life child. Mm -hmm. And so the court can really um, benefit the folks coming in there. And uh, if, if the kid has been left in foster home and you've watched this child grow in the system and now you're watching the parents and they're becoming um, the adoptive parents are becoming a family, that can be quite rewarding. Again, I have limited knowledge, which is which I'm grateful that I'll be getting sent to judge school if I'm elected. <laughs> but I'd like to, to do the full tour of duty or even work in a juvenile uh, arena because you can affect the kid's life earlier in life so you don't have to see them later in the criminal capacity. If you can positively affect people's lives, early in life, then you may not see them in the other divisions of the judicial system. That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, judge judge uh, candidate David Berger, who's running in seat 80, uh, look, I'm giving him a plug and he's not even here, has mentioned how much he wants to go into juvenile uh, criminal court, juvenile delinquency, and because you have so much of an opportunity to to make a difference on a, on a child before they're uh, potentially in and out of the criminal justice system for life. And so to be able to stop that rate of recidivism and make a difference in a child's life, yeah, would be a great and rewarding thing. Yeah. And I echo that. And again, I would add to that my uh, about 25 year experience being an educator, so dealing with young people and dealing with a lot of different types of young people wanting to learn and again, like I said, paying it forward, helping them grow and learn and become good productive members of society, I think it'd be interesting. And I do also think there's some sad cases too. Uh, I'm said to be very friendly and very easy to get along with. So I think if I were uh, to be lucky enough to be elected, I would be able to to serve well because I'm very sort of level-headed and down to earth and I can deal with a lot of different stressful situations without letting it get to me. So I think I could also okay. uh, do well in juvenile court. I have one other question if anybody has one or we can, and then we can wrap it up. But, but it's been very nice to have, but I want to ask about um, pro per litigants. Mm -hmm. Because here you have- Self-represented litigants. Yeah. Uh, what is it called? You, said, you said pro per. Yeah. But uh, yes, yeah, self-represented litigants. Self -represented People litigants. that don't have lawyers that's right, is that's the right. easy way of saying it. Pro se sometimes and pro yep, yes. per. Right. Yep. And, and these characters, um, I heard the other night, 75% of people in court are without a lawyer. Yes. Now, it's, it's not, in criminal court, not in criminal court. Right. But, but uh, yes. In civil court. Mm -hmm. That has to be fact-checked. But, but still, let's just assume mm -hmm. for a moment that it's right. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you know, so it's confusing. It's hard. Mm -hmm. As a judge, how do you deal with that? And you can see that it could be very frustrating mm -hmm. um, because for obvious reasons. And you can see that lawyers could take advantage of, and, but so what is a, your thoughts on that? And let's start on this end, we'll go back this time. I think, I think every litigant has a right to be heard, whether or not they can afford an attorney, excuse me, whether or not they can afford attorney or not. I think that, um, and judges know this, and they, they have, there are things, certain things put in place to deal with the, 
pro per litigant. In federal district court, they're, they're uh, safeguards and in state court mm -hmm. to make sure the person is competent to defend his or herself. And um, just a little guidance. Some are very well spoken. You may get college students or you may get just regular everyday folks who want to exercise their right mm -hmm. to be heard. I respect that. I don't have a problem with it at all. They may have to be put at the end of the calendar because it may take a while to get to a certain point that could get be gotten there quicker with a lawyer. So the judge would have to be patient and so would the court staff. So when you know that those cases are coming up, more than likely, they will have the other cases uh, be heard first. That way you can give the pro per litigant more time because uh, they will uh, need it, so mm. yeah. yeah. And again, I would say uh, that the advantage of voting for me clearly for seat number 72 is I already dealt with that. I already worked uh, at the superior court level uh, with an entire docket of all the judges, pro, uh, pro per or pro se litigants. Um, so I'm used to that already, um, and you're right, some of them, they do need a lot of extra time. Some of them, too, need uh, uh, help with their addictions and certainly mental health. They suffer from a lot of different mental health issues, so I think it's important that judges understand that. And I would, because as I said, I've worked with tons of those cases already. And you do need a lot of uh, experience. You also need a lot of patience with those people. So, you know, you can understand what they're trying to get to. And um, again, from my experience working so for so long with um, a lot of different people every single day, I'm used to fishing out of people what I need to know and asking probing questions uh, and being patient with people, even though personally I might not always feel that patient, but you gotta be patient with them. Um, so, so yes, I definitely second that, but also giving some mental health assistance, seeing or ask, answering that question from a broader point of view. Uh, Los Angeles County and a lot of the places in the nation actually suffers from a huge access to justice issue that I would be interested in looking into uh, if I were lucky enough to be elected judge. In that you write more and more people, so under the constitution you have a right to uh, have a, a defense counsel if you can't afford one yourself. But there is no such constitutional right for anything else than criminal law cases. And that's a huge, huge problem because as we know, uh, the median or the average income among uh, uh, everyday people is shrinking as the rich is becoming richer and richer. So what do we do about that? So you're right, I think in long term, I don't know, and it's a political question, but short term, I think judges can do a lot in having even, like they could give training lessons to people how to represent themselves better. Uh, do this some places in some courtrooms where, or some courthouses where they do that little videos, little kiosks or whatever, you know, and hauling in people from law school. So I uh, have taught for law school for many, many years at the ABA accredited law school level. And so I know that if we could somehow look at how many law students there are that are eager to get jobs and experience and hands-on experience and how many people really need free legal representation, I think there's a huge supply and demand there that could be met with if we could somehow have some, of course, some attorneys oversee that. But you're right, there's different new solutions that need to be looked at and that's why I think for seat number 72, we need someone who's a little more diverse than the traditional people, but it's a huge problem. Uh, as far as self-represented litigants or people that don't have lawyers, I dealt with that as a temporary judge uh, of the LA County Superior Court for the last four years. In traffic court, most people, 99% of people don't hire lawyers. Some do, but uh, most people don't. And one thing I noticed is that when people don't have lawyers and they're coming into court, they are scared to death. Mm -hmm. The number one fear that most people have is public speaking. Mm -hmm. So to get up in front of the courtroom, to stand with, by a mic, to have a police officer standing next to you, to have the bailiff with their gun and their badge and a judge in a black robe up on the bench, it's scary, it's intimidating. And so it was really a great opportunity for me to be able to lower the temperature for everybody, nobody's going to jail, and uh, let everybody know that, um, that it's gonna be okay, and to be able to be that calming, cooling effect, essentially a PR agent for the court system. I saw a lot of traffic court judges who would just uh, yell at people and berate them and really make an uncomfortable situation. People there are having to miss their work. They're having to uh, get childcare. They're not able to pick up their kids from school. Nobody wants to be there. So to handle the court efficiently, to get everybody out as quickly as possible, to lower the temperature and make people not be afraid, uh, 
I was happy to do that. And in small claims, as a judge, uh, you're not allowed to have lawyers. So the parties have to represent themselves, except for small claims appeals. And, and so uh, you're, as the judge, you're the lawyer for both sides. You're the one that's uh, making the objections if the person is trying to introduce hearsay, or if they're trying to introduce evidence that doesn't follow the rules of evidence. So as a, as a judge, in a case where somebody doesn't have an attorney, you kind of have to be the lawyer for them uh, and make sure that all the rules of court are, are followed. And I, I've been doing that for the last four years, I'm a little bit shy of four years, and I'd be happy and honored to continue doing it as a judge on the Los Angeles County Superior Court in C-145. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So any other uh, last minute questions before we wrap up with the judge? I'd like to give you all each an opportunity to Say it clearly, say your website, tell us what, you know, final punch, and we'll, uh, we're just very happy that you joined us. So we can go in this order if you like. Okay. So again, I'm Troy Slayton. I'm running for judge in seat 145. I'm only running against one person who uh, is a deputy district attorney who was found to have engaged in egregious prosecutorial misconduct. But that's not why you should vote against them. You should vote for me because I'm the better choice. I have a broad diversity of experience. Um, I've been working since I was five years old. I was a child actor on a bunch of TV shows in the 80s and 90s, but that's not why you should vote for me either. It's because I have the broad diversity of experience. I know how to talk to people. I know how to bring people together. Uh, I am gonna be the one who is most competent uh, on the bench because my diversity of experience in criminal law, civil law, family law, restraining orders. And so that's why I would hope you vote for me. My website, Troy Slayton for Judge. Dot com. You can find me on Facebook at Troy Slayton for Judge, Instagram, Twitter, Troy Slayton, and uh, please consider voting for me for seat 145. My name is Mayanna Dellinger. Thanks for listening to us uh, tonight. I'm running in seat number 72 against two more uh, traditional smart persons, nice persons, nothing wrong with them at all, but they are more traditional. Again, one is a DA, nothing wrong with that whatsoever, but I think there is uh, some point to getting some more diversity on the bench. And I have much professional diversity, as I've discussed tonight. Uh, I also have much per uh, personal diversity. Again, I'm a first-generation immigrant. I'm the only female running in that seat. The bench in LA is already about 75-80% male, uh, some are uh, great, but we need more females on that. I think we would uh, all tend to agree with that. So again, uh, I'm highly educated, I'm smart, I'm friendly, I worked behind the bench already with judges and for judges, uh, helping them achieve uh, record case closing uh, deadlines. I worked on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, I literally wrote the law in this circuit uh, for a year in completely unopposed. Uh, it, all the, uh, the opinions I proposed were completely uh, adopted by everyone else on the panel. So again, vote for uh, diverse people on the bench. And I will be one of them, Mayanna Dellinger for seat number 72. And I'm Carrie Annette Harper for seat 162. I am, as a civil rights attorney and a prior police officer, I have the widest range of experience of all the candidates in my race. I've argued at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals for a reversal in a lower court's ruling. I have won most of my civil rights actions in federal district court, and I have a very strong trial record in criminal and state criminal court. I am endorsed by Congresswoman Maxine Waters and a host of Democratic clubs, organizations, newspapers, and noted uh, lawyers in the community. I work very hard for my clients. I'd like to, very, to work very hard for the community in a different capacity. I can be fair, I can be firm. Uh, I wanna be a warm, welcoming face for folks to come into the courtroom and disperse equal justice to all. So, Carrie Harper, www.harper4judge.com, seat 162. Harper for Judge. And my website is www.dellingerforjudge.com and all my social media handles are also Dellinger for Judge or my Anna Dellinger. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank all. You Thank you so much for having me. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. And now we have um, a candidate who's going to join us for the council district race. Uh, 
in this district, District 2, uh, Mr. Ayindi Jones is here tonight. So we look forward to you. Address. Stand up and sit down. Whatever more comfortable. And we're going to begin. So, folks, we're rolling right in. All right. Thank you. Uh, would you prefer me to speak to you or the camera? It's up to you. You can sort of look at the camera. And okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, my name is Allende Jones. I'm proud to run for City Council of District Number Two, the district where I was raised. I was raised by proud parents who taught me innately the power that one person can make a difference if they have a heart to serve. People ask me often, why are you running for city council? So I talk to people and I always say the same thing. Why would you want to do something like that? And it's really very simple. I'm no different from that parent, mom who volunteers at the PTA meeting or that father who volunteers at a coach's meeting. You first have to have a heart to serve. That's the first requirement. You also must ensure that you want equal representation for all people, a fair distri distribution of resources. You must be willing to represent all people and not only special, special interests. I would be uh, afraid to say, if, if my wife is not here, I am so proud to be a husband. I have two young children. My wife is the reason why I can stand here and be supported. She's home now with my two beautiful children, and she has given me all the strength and the prayer to know that I can do this to help people. Um, a little bit about myself. I am a criminal defense attorney and family law attorney. So I understand very clearly that you must fight for anything that you want and that you must be willing to bend and work with people to really be effective. Uh, being married 10 years, I understand that you must first be willing to listen first. Uh, as a mental health professional, that's how I worked my way through law school and uh, also before law school. I served our most vulnerable adults and children in the classrooms, in the community. From having that experience, I understand that people need the opportunity to be heard. People's voice matters, all people. And when you care about all people, you can sincerely be the most effective. I stand by the truth that in order for our city to be its best, all people must be well. Not only the people who make a lot of money, but you need people who are without homes, you need people who are middle class. You need low income earners to do well. This is how we will ensure the success of this city. And as your candidate, a vote for Allende Jones will mean a representation for all people, a sincere desire to see change, but more importantly, to understand that we're better together. So that's a little bit about myself. That's Thank great. you. Thank you. I'm in the hot seat. Here we go. <laughs> no, it's great. It's great to have you. And I, Thank I think you. it's um, it says a lot coming out on, on a Thursday night. Uh, you know, we 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 have um, a, a district that spans from the hills up in Mulholland all the way out to Sadaport, where you know, out near the Sherman Way and the airport. How is it possible to represent 250,000 people? You know, who come from such a diverse. They have very different needs. Like you say, you got the you know, people who are doing very well and people who are not doing as well. How, you know, what's the philosophy? How can we make it work for everybody? Because so often I feel that, you know, those those um, elements are put at odds. You know, the yeah. neighborhood is facing a big developer with a lot of money. And how can we make, make that work? Well, yeah, I'll say this. Um, it won't be easy. I think you have to start with having a well-trained staff. Um, you know, the district being so large, it's really almost impossible for one person to effectively address all the issues. So that's why the importance of having a good staff. I think any city council, any really any elected official staff must be very diverse. You must have a representative that can represent all racial backgrounds, religious backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds, um, gender back, whatever that is, you need proper representation. I feel that when you have a seat at the table and people have a voice, it matters when you can share a different view. As an attorney, usually I am the only African-American in the room. And I understand the importance of that because I can address issues that only I have the life experience of addressing. No one else can, can do that as effective as I can. So coming back to your question, how can we really govern effectively? It starts with ensuring you have well-trained staff, you must ensure diversity in, in who you represent, but you also just must be willing to listen to everyone. 
So I've knocked on thousands of doors and pretty much people have the same concerns. This isn't rocket science, the, the, the game of politics. This is about people. Everyone wants the same things innately. People want to work, husbands and uh, mothers and wives want to provide for their children. We want to be able to take our parents to the hospital if need be. We want good health care coverage. We want the police to show up if we, if we call them. We want to have programs in our parks. This goes beyond race. This goes beyond uh, economics. This is really about innately what makes people prosper, and that's just opportunity. So to directly address your question, how can we govern? I think it will take time. I would be purposeful about who I appoint, and I would be mindful that I must have people that don't think the way I do, that don't see life the way I do, because we represent people. And a, a good elected representative is not just concerned about the people who voted for him or the party who he endorses. He is more effective and more, most concerned about everyone. I think that's the problem that I see in politics. Mm. People get elected, you have special interests, but that's not politics. That's not being a representative. An elected representative must represent all people, and I will be certain to do that. It's interesting, special interests, it's a good point. Yes. They, they made an announcement the other day that more news about fundraising. Now, have you been, you see, mentioned that you knocked on thousands of doors, but have you been fundraising at all, or have you been doing that? Because I know that we've been getting um, mailers from the council members mm -hmm. campaign, you know, and, and it's, the, you know, it's effective to hit people in the mailbox, but it's expensive, yes. it's not green, and it's kind of business as usual, because a lot of it's not even paid for by the council members, mm -hmm. paid for by a group of people who, you know, sign up, like, for a pack. So, if, if not, you know, it's okay if you're not raising money or if you are raising money, but what is the way that you've been bringing your message to the people? To I mean, knocking on doors is a good one, but are there are, is there a way to make it work against that kind of relentless mail uh, without it? Absolutely. You must, um, you, you can't be done without people. Um, I, you know, this is the first time that I'm on the ballot, but the second time that I've ran. Uh, the first time I tried to get on the ballot, 10 years ago, I was in law school. Um, I had people helping, I turned in signatures, but I recognized that I needed more assistance. So to come to your question, how can you be effective going against these giants that have really endless amount of finances? It takes time. Um, it takes a, a good ground game, a grassroots campaign. In terms of my fundraising, it's been from family, it's been from friends. And I will be honest, I have been less concerned about raising money because I'm, I'm still learning the game of politics. But I've been more concerned about directly addressing the needs and hearing the concerns of people. And I would say this, we must be aware or we must just have caution when we think that whoever has the most money or who has done the best fundraising is the best candidate, because that is not true. The business of politics, it's a business. Uh, people raise endless amounts of finances to get their message, but you have special backing with Citizens United that said the government can pretty much, First Amendment, we have that, we can't really restrict fundraising efforts. So you're up against something that's not easy. But if we say that because someone has more money, they're better, we're wrong. We cannot turn politics into business, just like we can't allow housing to become a business. That's the problem that I see now. We have all these high-end developers. Everyone's building for profit. And so we have politics is business, housing is business, and we see the problems that we face. We're not satisfied with our politicians. We feel like they don't hear our voices. We're not satisfied with the housing that's not available to low and middle class families. So yes, I wish I had more money because I could get my message out more. But I do believe that in local politics, the person that can directly address as many people on their doors, on their doorsteps, at the park, will be the most effective. When I knock on people's doors in Studio City and North Hollywood and Sun Valley, some people open, some don't. <laughs> it is what it is. But the, those that I do get a chance to engage with, they always say, thank you for knocking on my door. Thank you. Because they recognize that, number one, most politicians are not knocking on your door, especially if you're well off, because you can 
pay for a mailer or you can pay for a, a staff person to go do it. So they recognize just the innate power in the candidate themselves talking to them. And they also appreciate the fact that they know it's not easy, but when you can listen to someone, you can address their needs. So how do you beat them? You gotta organize, you can outwork them, simple as that. Great. Um, let me ask you about City Hall itself. Now City Hall, well, you've had some experience in government, I know, or you mentioned that you were at Metro in a training program, so mm. you got to see a slice of how uh, things operate behind yes. the scenes. I yes. Actually, do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, do you want to tell us about that uh, experience? I know you mentioned it in some place I heard it. Yes, sir. So when I was in high school, um, I had the pleasure. This was a long, long time ago, in the 90s. <laughs> okay. I went to North Hollywood High School, a class of 97, and they had a new magnet program. Uh, it was sponsored by the MTA at the time. Uh, it was called the Transportation Careers Academy. Uh, this was before uh, we had the red line or the gold line or any of these things. We, this was the ground level, the groundwork. So as part of that uh, program, it was sponsored by Metro, um, we were pretty much given the task of doing a lot of um, canvassing, uh, gathering data. As, as a student, uh, we were given a lot of responsibility. And so we really got to see the infrastructure of our great transit system from the beginning. And so I, I have been involved in, in government in that aspect, but, but really I think that City Hall operates like a family operates, like the courts operate, like any business operates. It's only effective as the people that are there. Right. If the people that are in that family or that business or City Hall are only concerned about being reelected or where can I get this next contribution from, then we have a problem. Well, this is a good, good point. So it, it's a fact that Almost all, not all, but mm -hmm. almost all of the votes of city council are unanimous. Mm -hmm. So that means that there's very little discussion, or if there is discussion, it's kind of done off off stage. Occasionally, yes. you'll have a big set piece where there's a debate among council members. Mm -hmm. Not that they all agree, but they all vote together. Mm -hmm. So the question is, if elected, you know, it's a little bit of a go along to get along. Like you know that. You may not agree with a particular uh, motion for something. It may be something that you're not interested in doing, you know, tightening up enforcement on low-level offenders. Maybe mm -hmm. something you don't feel good about, for example. But you're going to have to vote for it, or the motion that you're interested in a little more that's of a different ilk will possibly be stonewalled. So I see the idea behind it everybody getting together and voting on everybody's everything. Yeah. But is that good for the people or do we wind up with a bunch of things that don't really haven't been properly challenged? You know? So that's a question. Can you you know, are you are you gonna be able to stand up to the dozen other people and say, I I can't do it. You know? Um, absolutely. Uh, let me say this. You know, I was raised to believe that you must be true to yourself that the price of your integrity is, cannot be bought, that in hard moments, you must be willing to, to make the right choice. As an elected representative, I, I will not change. I can't, it's in my, my moral and genetic fabric. At the end of the day, I must look to my creator, I must look to my family, and they will be the ones who give me the affirmation that I need. For instance, uh, recently we had our impeachment and Mitt Romney was the sole Republican to stand by his conviction and rule, give a, a decision that was based on the facts and the law, which is his job. Other Republicans, they said, listen, I know he's guilty, but I'm not gonna make this call because blah, blah, blah. I think those people did a disservice, not only to their constituents, but also to themselves. Because at the end of the day, when all is done, you will have to look at yourself in the mirror and make that call as to whether or not you've done the right thing. So, it won't be easy being in a room of people who, are, who have been there, or have been calling the shots, to disagree with them. But I must be more mindful of my community, my neighborhood, and my own conviction. And it's not gonna be easy, but, I, but I'm willing to do it. My entire life has been against odds. I have been unemployed. I have been uh, college educated without a job, sleeping on my parents' floor. I have student debt. 
I went to law school once, left and went back again. I took the bar exam once, didn't pass it, took it again. So I'm okay with being down and getting back up because that's all of our stories. Anyone that says that it's gonna be an easy road to get to the end or get to wherever you feel like the goal is, is not truthful. So yes, I will absolutely govern according to what I believe is correct and not always with the city council members. And I think, you know, it's, the power in being a city council is that you have the, the ability to affect change for masses of people. That's why I wanted to be involved. It matters who's sitting in those seats. You know, so many people said it doesn't matter when I knocked on their doors. And unfortunately, a lot of those were people of color because we're used to kind of going with the status, having elected representatives who really aren't mindful of all of our needs. It's not easy, but it can be done. You must be willing to fight for what you know people need. And if you serve them correctly, adequately, ensure that they receive the things that they need to be successful at a basic level, I believe that you'll have the people that support you, they'll keep you in office, and that's bigger than 14 other members that you want to just please. Sure. Well, I will gladly retire. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I've been practicing law now for uh, nearly eight years. Uh, I've been in a private practice. Uh, I do family law and criminal defense. So I did ask that question before I decided to run. Uh, can I be a city councilman and also an attorney? And they said absolutely not because they don't want any, any foul play. Um, so I would, I would maintain my law license. I would keep it active, but I would not practice. And the good thing is that once elected, I'll be at City Hall, which overlooks the courthouse that I'm usually at, and I can uh, kind of, you know, just be happy about that. <laughs> but thank you for your question. Um, we want to, if this is more of an opinion piece. Yes, ma'am. We're in the midst of a shift in how we vote right mm -hmm. now. This is our first time. I'm curious about your feelings about the pros and cons of the new system. I love the new system. I really do. So first, let's talk about just the aspect of having it being done on, on a computer. So when they, they did the testing process for that, I was one of the people who was involved in the testing, and I loved it. So you can go through like an iPad. Are you familiar with the new system? So yeah, so you can go through iPad, market choice, and it prints out a paper ticket. I love it. Um, I also love the fact that people aren't just tied down to voting in one day. I think that is phenomenal. You know, in this time where we're really uh, uh, dealing with voter suppression and uh, people not being able to maybe leave work to go vote, or maybe they forget, which is why, especially in local politics, um, people, a lot of people don't really know what's happening. I think it's great because, you know, you have since the 22nd to the 3rd, right? And you can vote anywhere in L.A. County. I think that's how you can really get people out. If, if you miss a day, you can go another day. It gives people that opportunity to, to do it. That's the most important thing. I want people's support. I want their vote. But I tell people, it's just important to go vote. Exercise your democratic right to be heard so that at the end of the day, you can't complain because you didn't do anything. At least you took your part. One vote matters. One voice, one vote. So, yeah, I love the new system. Thank you. No problem. You know, one of the big issues that we're facing seems to be um, density. And we were talking a little bit, you mentioned development, mm -hmm. you know, coming and going. Um, you know, people are just confused because they don't know exactly what's happening. As if you are elected, is there a way, you know, it's kind of strange, but it seems like the council member has, he works with the individuals who are working on projects, but the public finds out sort of once they're already baked. Mm -hmm. Is there some, you know, something you can say about engagement and outreach? Because I feel that it's an important aspect of the job that has often gets kind of sideline um, in favor of the special interests. So, yes. you know, will you run an office that's open to the constituents or just to the, you know, lobbyists, so to speak? Yeah, I think that accountability and transparency is important. Uh, you know, those are, I, can't, I guess, blanket terms, and it's so easy to take those, those ideas for granted. But we must know what's happening at our city hall that determines what happens in our lives. It's important to know that. So I would, you know, make it a point to have a 
goal to have monthly town hall meetings in each city. I think that would be important. It's critical so that people can be heard. I would make it a point to work very closely with our neighborhood councils so that there can be direct involvement at the neighborhood to council level to city council. I think that in this in this era of mass media and social media, it's easy to get a message out if you want to. I think the people that are there, they don't want certain messages out because of the impact that it will have. And that's why you don't know. It's amazing how many people do not know who their councilman is, who their con congressman is, and what they're voting on. And I think that's a problem. If you have an elected official who's been in office for almost 12 years and someone does not know them, that said, that's on purpose. When I'm passing out flyers, I've noticed that there are some mailers there for the person in office. But when I, at my residence or certain people that I know, they haven't received those mailers. So what that says is the people that are in office, they are targeting certain voters. And that's a problem. I understand you trying to get into office. But when you target one particular voter, you're just ignoring the other voter. If you really want to be effective, you touch everybody. You speak to everybody. You give everybody a message, not just those people that you know would agree with you. So yes, I think oversight's important. Transparent communication with City Hall. You should know what's being voted on. You should know um, the agenda. You should know when City Council is meeting. You should know about public forums. You should know about, if I'm choosing this developer, here's why I chose them. Here was my list. Here's, is the, here are the pros and cons. I think that's important. Now, I, I know this. Everyone won't agree with all the things that I do. That's just normal. You know, my mother and father have been together for how many years? Long time. <laughs> and they don't always agree. But at the end of the day, their common goal is for the success of the family unit. So I will not always agree with the people that I represent. But I don't want to always be right. I think the good thing about bringing people in is that you get good ideas. I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. I know that I can't be. Not thinking that and being effective, you, you cannot be, it's impossible. So I would want to just have good people, surround myself with young people that are much more inclined to social media than I happen to be. Uh, people that are willing to support the message but give it out is key to just being a truly quality elected official. Okay, let me ask you a question about um, neighborhoods and transportation. Yes. Because what we have is a bunch of neighborhoods and, and public roadways. And parking, if you're near a section of town where there's activity, can be spreads out and comes into the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Now, in the old days, so what? But now we have a program with the city of LA, it's called Preferential Parking Districts. And it's a program where, you know, if, the, if it's set up in your neighborhood, and the way they do it is they get signatures from people in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. and if people agree to opt in, they write a little check, like $35, and you get a placard, and then you can stick it in the car and you're exempt from permit parking. So it's a way of, I don't want to say privatizing the public roadway, but it's, it's, it's making sure that the residents, is the argument on the side of, the, mm -hmm. of doing it, you know, can have their friends come over and not, but on the downside, where it gets a little complicated is, but the people who have been parking there and then walking a couple blocks down to the Ventura Boulevard, for example, to go to work, or you know, are being put in a place where they can't park anymore, and they're going to be cited if they stay there past two hours. So you can see there's competing interests, and I'm just curious if you've given it any thought or if you think that that's the kind of thing that is appropriate to be granting to neighborhoods or if it's more of the kind of thing that, you know, it, 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 if you do it here, they'll just move there. And I mean, it's a complicated issue, but should we be you know, protecting neighborhoods this way, or should we be uh, doing something else? Yeah, I, you know, I'm an advocate for neighborhoods first. People who live in an area, I think, should have priority of parking. I just think that's natural and normal. Um, if I work hard all day and I don't happen to have a driveway and I want to park in, near my apartment or, or very close, I want that option. Or if my wife is coming home late from the grocery store or doing something with the children, I want her to have priority in parking, of course. I am sensitive to people that use mass transit. Uh, I myself, sometimes when I go downtown, I'll park and catch the train. 
and I'll look for parking. And you have to be very mindful about the signs, which can be as confusing as anything as any law exam I've taken because one hour here, no parking there, and so forth and so on. So I'm sensitive to, to that issue. But I think that I would be more willing to protect the people that contribute to the fabric of the neighborhood. I think it's very important for them to have parking first. That's just my view. Okay. Um, any, okay. So uh, in terms of our parks, we have a couple of great parks in our district. Mm -hmm. um, and one nearby, the Studio City Recreation Center, it's called Beeman Park, just mm -hmm. around the corner. Yes. Is um, going to be experiencing uh, a renovation and it's up for some Prop 68 funding, which is a, a, a proposition about water bond. So it's going to help with the runoff and it's going to increase the budget to almost $16 million. But do you know about the project by any chance? Uh, I'm not very familiar. Okay. No. Well, that's okay because you're not alone. I think mm -hmm. that this is an example of one of the projects where the outreach has been minimum requirement. In other words, they, they have done, they've checked all the boxes to... Uh, you know, for the meetings that they've had about the plans, but they haven't really gone beyond pinning it up on the outside of the building. Mm -hmm. So the question is, um, should, you know, they be doing, because I think the project calls for a larger structure, like a basketball court, mm -hmm. a high school regulation basketball court, mm -hmm. in the spot where, if you know the park, a small rec center is currently located. Okay. So it, what it's, the problem is, I think, that it, there's some folks who believe that it's going to, um, encroach on the open space. So open space is critical in our, in our valley and city all over. We want green open space. You know, is this something that we should be doing, uh, putting buildings on the little bits of open field that we have left, or should we be, you know, doing something else? Well, you know, not, not being very uh, versed on this subject, uh, not knowing how it came across and, mm -hmm. and what type of outreach, as you said, was done to ensure that the residents we're okay with the process. I would say, uh, you know, open space is critical, uh, as we know. Um, the more open space you have, the better your mental health is, the better your, your breathing is, the more opportunity kids have to be physical and you can be outside. It's critical. Um, this park, I happen to, you know, not live far from the park. Uh, when I was younger, I took my nephew, who's an adult now, uh, to play basketball. Beautiful park. To see that, to know that that's potentially being limited in size, I think is concerning because this is already a small park in comparison to other parks. Um, it serves uh, you know, a large amount of people in this neighborhood. You have kids, and I will admit, I'm biased towards protecting children in all ways. Um, that's really the basis of my platform. That's really why I'm running. I know that it's bigger than me, right? I know that it's bigger than me. I, I must ensure that my life impacts the lives of not only my children, but also other children. So that's why I'm running. So yeah, so to hear that that's being encroached upon, that it will be limited, I think that's concerning. I'm not, you know, I didn't know about it and I don't live far. Right. Uh, my father didn't know about it, very intelligent, you know, so it's, it's clear that not much was done to get the word out. Right. I'm sure there was a public forum at City Hall that people didn't know about. Um, but yeah, I would, that is concerning. I think the more open space you have, the better. You know, now maybe that will increase revenue for the park, having a great basketball court with program. Maybe it will. Uh, maybe it will help um, with taxes. Maybe it will have more jobs. So there, I'm sure there are benefits to that. But whenever you're limiting park space, that's concerning for me. Yeah. It's also worth mentioning, we're also around the corner from, this is a hot spot right here, um, the rec center, the uh, Weddington Golf and Tennis mm -hmm. program, which is around the corner. And this has recently been acquired by a private school uh, called Harvard Westlake mm -hmm. uh, for $43 million. I think they bought it from a family, the Weddington family. And what's happening now, and you might be the council member if elected, is they're planning to um, change the current facility, remove many older trees and the golf course, mm -hmm. uh, and reduce the tennis courts by half to from 16 to 8. And this is a currently, it's publicly accessible. So people can go there. You may have to pay a few bucks, mm -hmm. but it's, it's open to the public. What they want to do instead is put a athletic facility for the Harvard-Westlake School, which, you know, may be um, in their interest. But the question is, you know, is there a balance? Because the people, it's not like we have a right to it. 
to the you know if they if the land is owned by the uh, by the school, they can do sort of what they want. But would you try to encourage the school to keep some of that land open to the public and you know like maybe the golf amenity or some aspect of it? Because it's just so heartbreaking to think mm-hmm. about Studio City. If you've been here for a long time, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. It's got, you know, and I don't know if I'm romanticizing it. Maybe it's mm-hmm. time for a change. And, you know, we've got to have, you know, a first-class athletic facility for a yeah. private school. But, you know, what do you think about that? And isn't that also more of the same where this vital open space, it's like, watch out what you got before it's gone, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. That's a great place. Uh, I love that place. I, I play golf there often. Uh, you see a lot of celebrities there. And when I say play golf, I mean pretend like I play golf, right? <laughs> I mean, go late at night, stand at the end and, and work on your driving. Um, you know, so Harvard Westlake, what they're doing is they're looking out for their future generation. They call themselves wanting to expand so that their students can have the best resource. But that school is very expensive, and so not everyone can go to that school, so it's very limited in the application of who you're affecting. To know that they bought that that place and they're potentially going to change it, uh, it's not it's not okay. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not okay because that place is, is a, if it's frequented by many people. It's a, a lower cost than many other golf clubs. Um, you can go there. It's a public facility. You can use it. I think that's important. We don't have a lot of space. You know, as we know that you know, one in three Los Angeles residents are considered park poor, meaning they have to travel pretty far to get to an open space to get the things that they need to for their own mental health. So I think yeah, that's concerning as well. Yeah. Um, right. Now, and the other question for this part of town, coming along Ventura Boulevard, you know, you have a vibrancy, which is nice, but there's got to be a balance. You know, we want um, bars and restaurants and things like that, which I think we have. But people have noticed, and I'm curious if you've noticed, you know, that there are some unusual vacancies, like suddenly Pier 1 is going out of business. And, you know, I think the gap on the other side of the street, Studio City out of business. And, you know, what's happening there? Because I feel like we want to stay ahead. It always seemed like Studio City was, you know, close enough in and still happening. But is it possible that we're pricing people out of our own town? Um, You know, then you've got Sportsman's uh, Lodge is going to be adding a probably saw they knocked down the the convention center so you know all of this is will be your job if uh, if elected um you know do you have some principles you'll follow or some guidelines or what can we do to keep um you know the place thriving yeah you know it's a concern for everyone and yes people are, are definitely being priced out people that have grown up here uh have raised families they cannot afford to buy a home Um, Just yesterday, I was canvassing south of the boulevard near Harvard Westlake, uh, talked to a gentleman, uh, 67 years old, uh, lifelong resident of Studio City. He said that he inherited his home from his parents. And he said, there is no way that I can afford the house that I live in because I don't make enough and I probably will never make enough. Please do something for our children. Something has to happen. So you're talking about people that understand even those people that are well off that are doing well they understand the magnitude of the problem that they may be okay but what about their children you know we're not guaranteed to have our children be athletes or or multi-million dollar business professionals but we want our kids to have the basic right to purchase a home the basic right to live maybe where their family lives so yes i think you have to you have to fight you have to be willing to to lay it all out You know, this job is a very important job because it affects so many people. People ask me, what does the city council do? I tell them, listen, everything that you see around you is the result of someone voting yay or nay for a particular thing. That development that came up, there was a vote on that. That sidewalk that's not done, somebody's ignoring that. That police presence or lack of somebody's either doing something or not doing something about that. So the magnitude of this job is tremendous. That's why you need someone with integrity, someone with purpose, someone with a background that is willing to lay it on the line, not just be a yes man, but the right man. And I think that a vote for me, Ayende Jones, is is that good choice. Right on. Now, in terms of 
the relationship between the city council and the state of California. You know, there's always the balance of local control. Who's going to be, you know, the, the city is always fighting to keep local control. The state is always uh, hoping to make a law that sets it for everybody. Like the governor would love to, you know, set the density rules, I think, if mm -hmm. he could. Um, you know, do you feel that you have the experience and the um, relationships to be an advocate for our community down here, up there, you know, up in Sacramento? I mean, are you prepared to, you know, lobby and, you know, advocate for our community? Yes, I am. Yeah. You know, the, the experience factor, you know, you hear that often. Um, you know, what experience do you have? Why are you qualified? Well, well no one is qualified to do a thing until they've done it. I know that if God called you to something, he will qualify you on the way there to get it done. So the experience that I bring is not necessarily government experience, but it's a vast wealth of experience. I'm a father. I understand about multitasking, that working families need to be able to provide for their families. I'm a husband. I know that I must listen first in all things. <laughs> I must listen first and then act and then speak. I've worked with kids, vulnerable kids in classrooms, kids with heartbreaking disability. I've worked, I've sat with them in classes. I've advocated for them with principals, with teachers, with other students. I've found homes for adults with disabilities. I've taken adults with disabilities from mental health facilities to their own apartments. I've had to work with managers. I've done so much. I've lived a life that is colorful, that's had down moments, that has great moments, but I'm not alone. We all have different experiences. So the experience that I bring is an experience that is dedicated to people. Yes, I'm a fighter. It's in me. I come from a background of strong men and women. I'm not going to be silenced just because I'm the minority in the room. I'm okay with standing up for people, even in the midst of someone that may want me to be quiet. So the good thing about being the councilman is that they cannot quiet you, that you have a voice, that it's a voice that will represent all people, and that's what I'm committed to. Interesting. Do you have a, a strong view about the upcoming presidential primary in California? We're all figuring out, yeah. those of us who are, uh, I think the Demo everyone is voting on March 3rd. Yes. So different ballots slightly. So I, you know, I'm leave open which side you might be on, but I think you're on, I think I know what side you're on. But that doesn't answer the question of who, you know, because it's complicated. Yes. So do you have a, are you leaning in a certain direction you want to educate us about? Balancing the progressive versus the mainstream. Yeah. How do we? Well, let me say what are we this. supposed to do? Yeah. yeah. No, let me say this. I think that um, the last four years has shown a, uh, a great disregard for everyone. I think that um, whenever you have a person in power that has isolated so many people, that has ostracized so many groups, that has spoken badly against so many different types of vulnerable people, that's a problem. So for me, I'm not a I'm not a fan of the current administration. I can't say that he does everything bad because I, I believe in, yes, protecting our borders. I believe in, yes, uh, America first. Of course, we want to see, I want to see my family doing well. But when you uh, project an attitude of, of division, when you project a complete disregard for the rule of law, uh, that's a problem for me as a, as a man, as a father, as a, as, a, as a husband, as an attorney. That's a problem. So in terms of my goal, I just want to see the best person for the job. Um, you know, I, I was an advocate for Biden because, you know, I, I think he served well under, under Obama, long track record. He likes to fight. He likes to talk mess. I thought, you know, I thought Biden was a good choice. I like uh, Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders really speaks to many things that a lot of impoverished people, a lot of disenfranchised people need. Health care free, student debt forgiven, uh, student education free. People need that. You know, and I, I'm not saying I'm socialist. But I recognize that, you know, we have socialist programs. Uh, Social Security is that. Um, people need help. Um, Elizabeth Warren, great ideas, great ideas, very intelligent. Um, Buttigieg, I like his freshness. I like the fact that he's young. I like the fact that he's bold enough to go stand a chance when he knows he's going against people who are far more experienced than him. I like his attitude. I just want to see the best person for the job. Um, how I will vote will be a decision I'll probably wait until the day that I decide to vote. But I know one vote for sure, it'll be Ayanda Jones for city council. Right. Right. <laughs> okay, any, any questions from anyone? Questions, please. Come on, questions. Come on up there. No? 
I keep going and I'll come at you. Okay. <laughs> um, talk about your youth a little bit. When you were growing up, were you an athlete? Were you, how did you do so well to, you know, make so much of yourself uh, so quickly? You're a young man, obviously. Yes, uh, you know, not as young as I used to be. I'm 40 years old. Okay. <laughs> you but know, younger than council member Percorian. Yes, yes, by a whole lot, by a whole lot. You know, my youth was spent. Uh, you know, I was born in, in right outside of Chicago. I was raised until I was nine uh, or 10 in Gary, Indiana, uh, not far from the Jackson Five. <laughs> um, and I came to North Hollywood, California, uh, went to Lancashire Elementary, uh, North Hollywood High School, Walter Reed Junior High, uh, Cal State Northridge, and then University of Laverne for law school. But my youth was filled with my dad, uh, who's a, a, a music, musician, uh, teaches African uh, percussions and culture and history. He would take me and we would do shows together. Um, I'm, I'm trained in African percussion. Uh, my dad owes me a lot of money still for free shows. <laughs> and, and so, you know, my dad has always been an entrepreneur. Um, he, he, there was a time when he sold products called Fresh and Clean Products, and he would take me with him. And uh, I guess a funny story, one day we sold a, a bunch of stuff. We, we had the greatest day ever. I was selling, he was selling only to come outside and the car had been towed away. <laughs> so we spent all that money we made on a tow truck, but we had McDonald's and that was great. Uh, I was raised by a beautiful mother who um, is a daycare provider and really just a person who has always shown the ability, excuse me, uh, mm. uh, my mother is a cancer survivor and is a, uh, and it's going through treatment again, so excuse me. Um, yeah, but I, I was raised by a mom who, who really just was always there, who always had a smile, who uh, in the midst of anything was always optimistic. So I had this great mix of a very optimistic and loving mother and a hardworking, sometimes grumpy dad, <laughs> but, but always gave me an example of doing the right thing, putting on a suit, working, um, not taking shortcuts. That's what my family taught me. So yeah, so they were big on education. My dad made them, forced us to read encyclopedias as, at a young age, before the internet. We bought a set, so I was reading those things. We were big on school. Uh, my dad uh, encouraged me for, 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 for you know, athletics. Uh, they encouraged me just to really to make my own choices and to be my own man. Uh, they have never forced me in a certain area. They've always just supported the person that I've been. Um, and, and I appreciate that. It's, it's the reason that I have a heart to serve. It's the reason that I have a, a wife and children. They are the reason why. And so I'm proud that they can watch this, that they can see the, that I, it was all worth it. You know, it, it was all worth it. I've been in trouble before. Uh, I have, you know, I've been a kid and stole from the store. You know, I've been in trouble with the principals. So I have this wonderful background, the mix. And so I can speak to people that are not doing well, people that have made mistakes, people that need a second <laughs> chance. I can speak to that. I can speak to people who are doing fantastic because I'm in a career where I, I deal with a lot of wealthy people. We had judges before me. Um, I, I deal with a lot of different people. And so I think that my background, uh, my upbringing, allows me to really be effective, to really see who people are and what they need. And I really value that. That's wonderful. And you said you have children. Yes. That's wonderful. Yes. Oh, is it a, both a boy and a girl? Yeah, two boys, oh, okay. uh, three uh, and a half and one and a half. Oh, wow. Woo! Right. Yeah, yeah. That's a full time job. Oh, full time, not easy, but it's so worth it. Um, to you know, to see that my children's faces at the end of a long day. I'll get home tonight; they'll be asleep. I'll do my best to wake them up, <laughs> just so I can spend a little bit of time with them. But yeah, it's it's really it's really really encouraged me when I see my children. I see the benefit that a, a close knit family how that impacts them. I see the benefit of me being able to provide for them. I see the benefit of them living in a good neighborhood. I see the benefit of them having a good neighborhood, community. And as a family law attorney, I also know what it means when people don't have those opportunities, when people don't have good families or a good neighborhood or, or good options. And so that has made me want to serve people because I think you've got to understand where people are to even address them. 
you know, you can say that I can understand you without being there, but I don't think that's true. I think you have to sometimes be in a person's shoes to see what they see, which is why I can speak to so many things that the neighborhoods, our communities are experiencing. I can speak to homelessness because there have been times when we have been illegally evicted and we have had forced to stay with friends. I can speak to unemployment because I've been educated, college educated without a job, doing valet parking with a college degree, looking to do labor ready with a college degree. I can speak to people who have student debt or credit card debt. I can speak to those people because I've been there. It's not, I'm not saying I think I know what it's like, I know what it's like. But I also see that when you talk to people, when you give them a voice, that empowers them. When I talk with homeless people, when I talk to people in, in bad neighborhoods, they're excited to see me there because they know at least someone is taking the time to listen to them. And that's the least we can do as an elected representative. And that's what I want to do. What, what do we say, what do you say to the community that around um, who, who are frustrated by the homelessness situation to the degree where they, you know, for example, people will complain about, understandably perhaps, you know, people sleeping yes. underneath the freeway underpass. And, you know, it, it's heartbreaking for all of us, I think it's fair to say. And, you know, the, the officials and the police sort of collectively throw their hands up in the air because there's a, you know, there seems to be a legal problem with moving. I think everybody knows it's complicated, but, you know, what do you, how can you address the community who are banging their fists and want action? You know, I think everyone, including the incumbents, struggle with it, but I give you a chance to say, you know, what can we, what do you tell the community who are not feeling sympathetic or passionate, they're feeling afraid and, you know, under, that they feel like it's not fair. Yeah. You know, it's important to, to, to listen to people. It's important to hear that. I'm impacted by it. I live near the freeway and I can say that in reality, I've seen some of the same homeless people for 15 years. Now, I'm not making that up. I've seen the same people. So what do you tell people when we're dealing with such a, a problem? Statewide, countrywide, there's no one answer. This is not something that can be fixed by your government official. This is a moral duty. This is a, a civic responsibility. This is something that we have to address and it's multi-layered. My understanding is, of course, when we're talking about people that do not have homes, homeless people, of course, the first thing people say is they need housing. How come we don't have housing? Period, that fixes it, but that's not necessarily true. Because if, you, if a person is sick in some way, mental health, um, some type of drug abuse, a victim of domestic violence, um, um, uh, an elderly person who has been taken advantage of by predatory lending or any number of things, a uh, disabled veteran, you're talking about people that need different options to survive, to do well. Putting these people just in a home or finding a place for them to go will not fix it I dare to say most of those people will leave that place and be on the streets and you have the same problems. So for me, I'd say that we must ensure that we work with nonprofit developers to meet the affordable housing need, number one. But coupled with that, we have to ensure that we are able to treat effectively the many issues that people have. I believe that we need to have more treatment centers. I think that that will be a good revenue for local businesses, which will create tax revenue, which will fund more programs. I think that if you open it up to the thinking that instead of just thinking housing, we think treatment, then I think more people will be on board because you need what I think it's one in three that deals with some type of mental health. And wouldn't you be crazy or, or think crazy or, or think a different way if you lived on the streets, if you had to use the bathroom on the streets, if you had children on the streets. So it's, it's, it's not an easy answer. So what I tell people when they ask me, because that's usually the number one thing, I tell them that, listen, this is not something that I can solve as your elected representative. This is something that a community must be responsible for. We must change our thinking first. We need to see these people not as uh, people that we need to get rid of, or people that are no good. These are people that maybe have just been without a job. These are women who are, have been victims. 
These are children. These are people who have served our country. Um, as part of my platform, I say that my level of priority is to ensure that some people receive priority housing before others. Those people to me would be our disabled, our children, our veterans, and our elderly. These are people that are vulnerable, that are always ignored, that must be given priority. That's my view. What I tell people is that it's gonna take time, it's gonna take efforts. I will ensure that I work effectively with all of our elected representatives, with Sacramento, with our federal government, because we can do it together. It takes time. You know, you always say, where's the money? Find me the money. And so once elected, I'll be able to, to look at our budget to see where we can take money from to fund more resources for our homeless people. We have the money. This, we have a budget of $10.4 billion, and we were over budget. And when you read what the mayor said or city council member says, they all say, listen, we're over budget, but that's a good thing. We're funding the things that matter. We're funding things that will make a difference. And so I say, if we can go over budget for some things, then we can go over budget for some other things. And so we can find a way. Los Angeles, this is the greatest city in the, in the world. No better place than this. We set the example, we shine brightly. People want to be here, which is why it's crowded and people can't live here, they grew up here. So we need to spend the money. I think you get what you pay for. I think we can create revenue to help people and to have more treatment centers and housing by boosting our local economy. That is the natural way to help the community. It can get done. We must be creative, and I will do that. Great. Um, any other questions? Okay. Um, you know, I think that uh, the council member has been in office for, is it going to be 12? I think it's three terms. Is that long enough or too long? I mean, do you feel that, you know, term limits are something that makes sense? I think there are term limits, to be clear. But yes. Is that enough time to get the job done? 12 years? Hmm. It should be, right. definitely. If, you, if, if there are excuses after 12 years, that's just an excuse. Right. I think it's clear, it's clear that people deserve better. And we can do better, but people need to vote. Right. Um, I want people's vote. I want you, when you see Allende Jones, I want you to circle it put an asterisk by it, that's my vote. And then at the right end candidate, write my name there too. I hit they chose twice because it matters. Um, it, term limits are important. I think a, a fresh change of leadership is good. I think a problem that you see with our Congress, our federal government, there are no term limits for our Congress members. And you have the same thing year after year. I think that 12 years is a good amount of time. I think that uh, the current council member has done his service, and I would like to be able to lead our city to the next generation. Great. Um, would you like to give a closing comment or two, or, uh, and then we can wrap it up, or we can keep going? It's up to you. you hey, think? you know, yeah. whatever yeah. you have time for, the library is closed. It's yeah. our library I right now. <laughs> um, you know, I would say this to people who have not voted, uh, people who are considering who to vote for. I would strongly advocate that you give me, Allende Jones, the opportunity to be of service. I know what it takes to help people. I, I've done it throughout my young life, but I've been directly impactful in every area that I've served in. I've seen lives changed. My parents taught me that one person makes a difference, but if you can bring other people in, you make more of a difference. I'm involved because I know that you need good people in office. It matters who sits in those seats. I look forward to a city, whether or not I'm the representative, but a city that ensures equal resources for all people, a city where we're transparent and on purpose about addressing the needs of all people, a city that has a heart to help people that are not doing well. Those are my goals. Those are the things that I teach my children. Be mindful of how you treat others. Help that person that needs help. Be a friend to that person who's considered an outcast. Be mindful that what you do matters. That's what I teach my kids. That's what was taught to me. So as a councilman, Councilman Allende Jones will be a person who is directly only responsible to the people who put me in office. And those that didn't vote for me, I will have the 
obligation, the encouragement. I will be incentivized to address them even more because I want to bring everybody into the fold. I would not be the type of leader that says, you didn't vote for me, you don't see things my way, forget you then, go home. That's not the way to get it done. We've seen in history, the most effective people, they go across, they say, let me help you. You don't agree with me, but let's talk. It's nothing wrong with that. And that's what I plan to do. So I look forward to, you know, being involved. Uh, we don't have to wrap it up, but let me make sure I get my email. Uh, you know, you can reach me. My website is it's Jones for City Council. Uh, Instagram, which I'm still learning, it's Jones, the number four city council. But I think what you see with me is what you get. Right. When you see me, you see a person who I, I'm emotional. <laughs> I am direct, but I'm loving and I'm respectful. And I believe that it's important for people to lead with integrity. And that will not change. That's not something that I'm saying to be elected. That's something that I've led my entire life doing. And that will be the councilman that I will be. Excellent. Have you been to any, uh, <laughs> have, you had any uh, have you had any experience with Councilmember Krikorian uh, yet? Well, um, I have not directly, uh, not directly. Um, a church that I go to in uh, North Hollywood, uh, First Baptist, um, he works, he has worked on uh, some issues there with a few church members. So secondhand, I've gotten information. I've met him recently at a, a candidate forum. Um, was that the one out in, uh, at the Sadequoy Elementary? Yes, yes. Um, he was very cordial, um, very respectful. Um, he welcomed competition. Uh, and so, yeah, he, he was okay. With I just him. want to say for the record, we did, of course, invite him uh, to join. And yes. he wasn't, uh, he did not uh, respond. But, you know, we're very delighted that you've come and that you've come here. And well, I think you've given a great presentation. And we, we look forward to uh, March 3rd. Everybody knows what to do. Um, and what's that? Hopefully. <laughs> and, 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 and let's remind them. Let's remind them. So, again, I'm running for city council district number two. I'm on the ballot. I'm third on the list. You'll see it real clear. Allende Jones. I would love people to circle that, to mark it, to however you vote, vote for me. I am committed to serving people. I will ensure that all people have a voice at the table. City Hall is a place where elected representatives meet, they discuss issues, and they get the job done. If given the privilege to serve the great community that I grew up in, I will judge with a moral character. I will ensure that we are better off than when we started. And I guarantee that our children will see the difference. We will make the difference. I say over and over again, this is our city, the people that have lived here, that grew here, that have built here. It's our time. It's time for something new. It's time for a new vision for our city. And that vision should be based in equality. So a vote for me, Allende Jones, is a vote for that. And I really appreciate the time tonight. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you. I will just, uh, so that will wrap up our forum for tonight. I just want to say that we, we also invited um, Congressman Sherman uh, and his and the other candidates in that race uh, who did not come but we did hear from some of the other candidates earlier it's been uh, our pleasure to bring this information to you and we look forward to future forums and thank you all for coming thank you. all right thank you